um, I that was on the stream. The idea of going to camp the first weekend in okay. September. You have there's lots of information on the website. Yes, and there's that's a, the one. Okay, a little bit a of bit a more. survey that you we are encouraging people Perfect. that are interested in going to, to um, I don't know why fill out so that we have an idea that's of some of the people that are coming. Yeah, we sure. have the music program nailed down. And so Dick Jackson and Kathy Baker have committed to coming to camp uh, and providing, <laughs> Maureen says, yay. So anybody that knows these folks, they're from Victoria and they run an online choir and the Getting Higher Choir in Victoria. And they're close personal friends of mine, so I might have twisted an arm or two. So please go to the to our website. There's a camp thing right at the top left hand corner and fill in your um, intent. It is not a promise. It's an intent. Thank you. Just want to check with our tech folks if we're good to go or if you'd like us to wait just a minute we're good okay in that case we're going to start with a prelude <laughs> was by Jason Shelton, who was the music minister at the UU Church in Nashville. And he wrote it with their youth group um, because their youth group was going to go to a protest. And they said, we're so tired of saying, we don't want to do this or stop doing this or quit being this. We want to say what we do want. And so he took them out to the parking lot of the church and marched them around and said, tell me what you want. What do you want? What, what's the world that you would like to see? And these are the lyrics that they came up with and the song that he came up with for them. Our opening words this morning are by Carter Haywood. We are not automatic lovers of self, others, world, or God. Love does not just happen. We are not love machines, puppets on a string of a deity called love. Love is a choice, not simply or necessarily a rational one, but rather a willingness to be present with others without pretense or guile. 
Love is a conversion to humanity, a willingness to participate with others in the healing of a broken world and broken lives. Love is the choice to experience life as a member of the human family, a partner in the dance of life, rather than as an alien in the world or as a deity above the world, aloof and apart. I'm going to invite John Pater to light our chalice this morning. And as he does, we have words by Maureen Killeran. Love is the aspiration, the spirit that moves and inspires the faith we share. Rightly understood, love can nurture our spirits and transform the world. May the flame of this chalice honor and embody the power and the blessing of the love we need, the love we give, and the love we are challenged always to remember and share. And I've also invited John to share the story of his shirt this morning. <laughs> So this shirt goes back to 1986. That's the, that's the day I got married to Michelle. And it was, my, it was my going away shirt. I had white pants and then this wonderful pink shirt. That was very, you know, hippie of me. Anyway. Well, I know I, for one, don't fit any clothes from the 80s. <laughs> Just saying, so congratulations, John, and, Mich and Michelle. Um, we have our first hymn this morning. Uh, for those of you who are with us online, thank you for joining us, those of you online. Uh, the words should be coming up on your screen for us here in the sanctuary. The words will be coming up on our big screen. And I uh, invite you to rise as you're willing and able as we sing together, Where? is our holy church, number 113. has put together this beautiful service this morning and as always she has selected some amazing readings this is one by a name that many of you might be familiar with Fred Small who writes siding with love where is our holy church we're on the side of love many Unitarian Universalists suffer from a chronic identity crisis People ask us, what do Unitarian Universalists believe? And we freeze. We don't know what to say. Because Unitarian Universalists believe so many things, so many different things. We are priests of paradox, apostles of ambiguity, nattering nabobs of nuance. And so the Unitarian Universalist Association produces eight principles and six sources and countless pamphlets and little wallet cards all to remind us what we kind of sort of believe and we are exhorted to compose elevator speeches summations of Unitarian Universalism so pithy they might be recited on an elevator in its fleeting passage between floors do you believe in God question simple Answer, impossible. Define God. 
define believe, define we, define in. <laughs> Whatever God is or is not, I don't think God cares what we believe. I don't think Jesus cares what we believe, and I know the Buddha doesn't care what we believe. The question, the important question is not what we believe. It's where we stand. I want to stand with love. Of course, when I say standing, I'm not talking about a physical posture. Rosa Parks stood on the side of love by remaining seated. I'm talking about a moral stance, not just assumed privately in our hearts, but witnessed boldly in our families, our schools, our workplaces, our communities, in our halls of parliament. I'm talking about faith in action. I'm not talking about sanctimony. I'm talking about intentionality. Understanding that our practice will be imperfect as each of us is imperfect. What is our purpose? What is our aspiration? What is our commitment to side with love? When Unitarian Lydia Maria Child defined, defiled the prohibition of her time against women speaking in public, and demanded freedom for enslaved African Americans and the vote for women when she protested the, tri the trial of tears, the brutal removal of the Cherokee, she was standing with love. When Unitarian Universalist minister Jim Reeb heeded the call of Martin Luther King Jr. and was bludgeoned to death by racists, he was siding with love. Siding with love doesn't require power. It requires courage. Because courage is power. When a child on a playground sticks up for another who is teased or bullied or left out because they're different, that child is siding with love. Siding with love affirms a full humanity of all people. It honors the inherent worth and dignity, the spark of the divine in each and every person. Siding with love means treating each other well, whether ally or adversary. Love is patient, wrote the Apostle Paul. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Siding with love means being more committed to being reconciled than to be right. Love does not insist on its own way. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. A religious person, Rabbi Abraham Heschel taught us, is one whose greatest passion is compassion whose greatest strength is love and defiance of despair. His friend Martin Luther King Jr. added, I have decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. So when someone asks us what Unitarian Universists believe, or what we're speaking out, or why we're speaking out on, or why we're speaking out on gay rights, or migrant rights, or disability rights, or human rights, or why we bother, bother to go to church on Sunday, let's tell them we are siding with love. Choral response from the choir is, Love Has Already Won, by Jason Shelton.
going to take an offering to collect the work of our church. We are a self-supporting organization and generosity is also one of the values that we try to grow in our congregation and as individuals. And um, half of the unidentified contribution is donated to a local charity um, because we realize that it takes lots of hands in this community to provide the care that we need to sustain each other and to do good work and the charity of the month for February is iHuman. iHuman is an amazing organization who through the arts reaches out to young people to provide certainly life skills and training but also hope and resilience and a place to feel heard and welcomed and so they do tremendous work in the inner city um, and are connected with a lot of other organizations to help be the liaison to ensure that youth don't get lost in the system and that their, their talents are recognized and that their individual worth is felt. And so with that, we will accept your donations generously. Thank you. morning. My name is Kim Lang and my pronouns are she, her. Today I'm reading The Body of Love by Elizabeth Bucky. Elizabeth begins her piece with a quote from 1 Corinthians. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member but of many. If the foot were to say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear were to say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. 
If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? Where, if the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. She goes on to say, we're part of an interdependent web of existence. Sometimes that interdependence is physical. In 2015, my dad almost died of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Medical for your lungs are turning into scar tissue and we don't know why. In August, he told me what hymns he wanted at his funeral. We watched him slip away, getting weaker and weaker. But one night in December, a stranger died. And my family and several others on the Oregon waiting list got a call. The day after winter solstice, my dad received a life-saving transplant. I remember the cycles of hope and fear, waiting for the organs to arrive from out of town, sharing an ec ecstatic family hug when the surgery was successful. It was disruptive and strange to spend Christmas in the hospital, living on endless cups of coffee and constant hand washing, even more so to know that someone had died to bring this hope and to wonder how the donor's family mourned at the same time we rejoiced. This gift of life wasn't just warm and fuzzy, it came with disruption and responsibility. Something was forever changed in our family. Something also changed in how I understand human connection. One day, uh, about a year and a half later, I spotted a man wearing a donate life gear on a walk with his mother and I stopped him. Hey, uh, this is weird. But I saw your hat and just wanted to see what your connection is. Uh, my dad is a transient, transplant recipient. The man told me his brother had died young and they chose organ donation. They kept on getting notifications, his mother said. His eyes were in Tennessee, his lungs were over here. He had been a small person, so his heart went to a child. They think sometimes about how those living pieces are still living all over the country. I told them I would probably never meet or know my dad's donor family and asked if I could thank them, and I did. Christian teachings use the image of one body to describe the beloved community. This is part of what it means to me now organs and tissue connecting strangers across time and space. We need one another to survive, not just abstractly, but in our flesh, in our blood, in the choices we make to give life even amidst death. What would change if we, um, if I, lived with this knowledge? If my cousin's heart kept your child alive, if my old blood saved the life of the religiously conservative man in your neighborhood, if your uncle's lungs breathed air into my dad's body the day he met his granddaughter, how would I act if I really knew that we were not isolated individuals, but parts of each other's being? What grace, messy, vulnerable, and disturbing, might come to dwell among us. Thank you, Kim. Let love continue long. That's the title of our next hymn, and actually how appropriate considering what we've just heard. I invite you to rise as you're willing and able as we join in singing number 129, Let Love Continue Long.
continue long and lead us on our way. And if that love be strong, no hurt can have a say. For if that love remains but strong, no hurt can ever have a say. Each Sunday we share this love that we have for each other, for this beloved community, for our country, for our world. There's much that's going on right now in our own lives, in the lives of those in our global community. We struggle with war, we struggle with displacement, we struggle with natural disaster, the loss of lives. But if that love be strong, we will remain strong together. For those of you who are with us online, I invite you to take a moment to write your thoughts, your prayers, your wishes, your love for your community in the chat provided. For us here in the sanctuary, we have two candle stations set up. I invite you to come around, pick up your taper, face the back of the church if you would, if you would, so those watching online can see that we are here with those who are with us online as well. So if you have a candle of concern, a joy, a celebration, I invite you to come forward now to light a candle. to ask Marilyn to light one last candle, a candle of love. 
for all of you who are with us online, for all of us here in this blessed space, for all of those who we're thinking of at this time, may this light of love give us strength, resilience, hope, and may we know that we are never alone. May it be so. Blessed be. So I wrote this message, and as I was writing it, I realized it really <laughs> is just the conversation I keep having in my head with myself over and over and over and over, and mostly what I needed to hear. So I hope that it uh, resonates with you too. It's called Choosing Love. So Valentine's Day is right around the corner, and we're being bombarded with messages about love. It's said that we fall in love, or someday our prince or princess will come, or that love will find us when we least expect it. Like it's this thing that we have no part in. But what if we choose love? And not just romantic love, but love as a way of life. What if we see love as a core value, love as our life's work? In our lobby, we had, and I forgot to check if it's still there, but we had a poster with multiple versions of the golden rule. And really, they're just all variations on the command to love our neighbor. St. Francis is quoted as saying, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. What if we adapted that just a little and made it our life's work to proclaim love at all times? and if necessary, use words. To live a life centered in love, to me, is a compelling aspiration. But what would it really look like? Does it require grand gestures and public declarations? Well, it could. But to me, it's the little everyday actions and gestures that let most people know that they're truly loved. Now, I think a life centered on love requires only two things, and that sounds really simple, but I keep finding that these two things are probably two of the hardest things that there are. To value relationship above all else, and to be truly present to another's needs. We all want to belong, to feel heard, to feel appreciated and competent, and sometimes our own needs make it difficult to see and fill those needs for others. And when I was doing some research and some reading in preparation for this service, I came across what I think is a beautiful poem by Norwegian writer Arne Garberg. And he wrote, to love a person is to learn the song that is in their heart and to sing it to them when they have forgotten. Isn't that beautiful? To love a person is to learn the song that's in their heart and sing it to them when they've forgotten. Don't we all want somebody to understand us and the songs in our hearts that deeply? But then I thought about it. How many people could I say that I truly listened that deeply to, that I took the time to understand in that way? In how many relationships have I taken the care to set aside my own ego or my own desire to be right or in control and truly listen, to truly learn the song in the other person's heart? As you'll hear in the meditation reading, we know that we ourselves need understanding, affection and recognition. Why is it that we so often then hesitate to extend these precious gifts to others. The cost of a kind word is so small. The moment that it takes to truly listen could hardly be better used. 
and a gesture of forgiveness can mark a new beginning. An embrace or a note of appreciation can convey crucial encouragement and comfort. And yet so often we fail, even with our own families, to live by that sacred command that we should love one another. And boy, that, those words just ring so truly for me, because I truly believe this with every fiber of my being, that to have love at the center is the way that we need to be. But knowing that, I still find myself getting impatient and prickly way more often than I would like. That said, though, I don't think we should stop trying. And I actually know that it's possible to live in a love-centered way because in many ways, we're already doing it in this congregation. Our co congregational covenant, which we introduced this September, intentionally begins with the words, guided by love. And I see that kind of action here. Every time someone is fully present when they're listening to someone else, that is love in action. We've acted in love as we started learning more about our other cultures and doing the uncomfortable work of examining our own biases to ensure that we can fully welcome others. I saw a lot of love in action when we moved from our former building to this building and although the old building held precious memories for so many people, they chose to leave that familiar for the unknown so that there would be room to welcome new people and grow the faith that they had found so central to their lives. That was a huge act of love. And I've seen love when someone takes time to welcome someone new or teach somebody something or even harder, is open to trying something a different way when the newcomer suggests it. So as our opening words said, love is a choice, not simply or necessarily a rational choice, but rather a willingness to be present to others without pretense or guile. Love is a conversion to humanity, a willingness to participate with others in the healing of a broken world and broken lives and love is the choice to experience the world as a member of the human family. Rightly understood, love can nurture our spirits and transform the world. Preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words. I actually heard those words at a friend's funeral last month. And they were fitting because that's how he lived. And I don't know if he knew this last poem, but I know he'd agree. In the end, it won't matter how much we have, but how generously we have given. And it won't matter how much we know, but rather how we live. And it won't matter how much we believe, but how deeply we love.
I invite you now into a time of meditation. If it's comfortable for you, close your eyes, feel the support in the back of your seat or the floor or your bed, wherever you happen to be. Take a couple deep breaths in and just let it out. At this quiet time and in this place of worship, we would seek to know more deeply what it means to love one another. We know so well our own needs. We know that we ourselves need understanding, affection, and recognition. Why is it then that we so often hesitate to extend these precious gifts to others? The cost of a kind word is small. The moment it takes to truly listen could hardly be better used. A gesture of forgiveness can mark a new beginning. An embrace or a note of encouragement can convey comfort. And yet so often we fail, even within our own families, to live by the sacred command that we should love one another. O oh, spirit of life and love, strengthen our faith, increase our resolve to give more generously of ourselves. We pray for the courage to take the risks of love. We pray for the insight to see ourselves and others in perspective. And we pray for humility and understanding that we may always stand ready to forgive and begin anew. When you're ready, I would invite you to open your eyes. Take a couple gentle breaths. And join me in the response of reading. Your response is no one is outside the circle of love. We know that hurt moves through the world, perpetuated in action, inaction, and indifference. Our values call us to live in the reality of the heartbreak of our world, remembering that no one is outside the circle of love. We, who are Unitarian Universalists, not only affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person, we also affirm the inherent wholeness of every being, despite apparent brokenness because no one is outside the circle of love. We know that things break or break down, promises, friendships, sobriety, hope, communication. This happens because our human hearts and our very institutions are frail and imperfect. We make mistakes, life is messy, but no one is outside the circle of love. With compassion as our guide, we seek the well-being of all people. We seek to dismantle systems of oppression that undermine our collective humanity. And we believe that we're here to guide one another toward love, as no one is outside the circle of love. And no matter how fractured we are, or once were, we can make whole people of ourselves. We are whole at our core because of the great unnameable, sometimes inconceivable love in which we live, remembering that no one is outside the circle of love. Please join now in hymn number 325, Love Makes a Bridge. Let's stay seated for this one.
focus of our service has not been on romantic love. It's awfully close to Valentine's Day and that bombarding of messages got to me just a little bit, so I had to slip in a couple readings. But they might be a little different than the usual romantic love readings that you're used to. So I'm going to invite Lynn and John forward to read those. <laughs> That's my John. <laughs> no, no, honey. You can stay there. <laughs> Funny. Uh, yes, I'm Lynn Turvey. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, and the reading is by Ken Nye called Making Love. As years go by and passions cool, we make love in places that young lovers only dream about. We make love at the kitchen table, a, a scrabble board, the mattress, and hints to help the other, our passionate kisses. We make love in the car, thrilling to beautiful scenery or a rarely seen wild animal. We make love in front of the fireplace, watching a game show, sharing our latest craft creations. We make love on the middle school hockey field, proudly watching our granddaughter dribble the ball down the field with half the opposing team in hot pursuit. We make love in the bathroom where I marvel at the beauty of my companion and friends of so many years and tell her as she lathers all over that she is the prettiest girl I know. We make love in bed with our pajamas on, she curled up against me spoon on spoon, feeling each other's warmth and whispering before falling into sleep, I love you. We are so shamelessly promiscuous, we make love in church for God's sake, sharing the hymnal hand on hand, <laughs> touching during prayers to say to the other without words or look, you are the rock of my happiness. Wonderfully, Heavy breathing is still in our repertoire. But the bond between us that challenges even death is the love made here and there, time and time again, side by side. My name is John Pater. My pronouns are he and him. And the poem, the reading I'm going to share with you has a little bit of a 37-year-old shirt as the backdrop. Kind of. So this is called The Longly Weds Know by Leah Furness. The Longly Weds know that it isn't about the golden anniversary at all, but about all the unremarkable years that Hallmark doesn't even make a card for. It's about the second anniversary when they were surprised to find they cared for each other more than last year. And the fourth when both kids had chicken pox and she threw her shoe at him for no real reason. <laughs> and the sixth, when he accidentally got drunk on the way home from work because being a husband and father was so damn hard. It's about the 11th and 12th and 13th years when they discovered they could survive crisis. And the 22nd anniversary when they looked at each other across the empty nest and found it good. It's about the 37th year when she finally decided she could never change him. <laughs> and the 38th when he decided a little change wasn't that bad. <laughs> it's about the 46th anniversary when they both bought cards and forgot to give them to each other. <laughs> but most of all, it's about the end of the 49th year when they discovered you don't have to be old to have your 50th anniversary. Our closing hymn this morning is a world premiere and a true show of love from our resident composer Gordon Ritchie, a hymn that he has written just for us. There is a love in my heart 
Here's the clincher. Can you hear it? Will you hear it? There's a love in my heart, and you know what? It's waiting for you. These words came to me in April of 2022. I'm not sure why, and that doesn't matter any longer. This tune is what we call a zipper tune. You'll notice uh, there's four verses, and there's only one word that changes for every verse. We're just going to go right into it and join in as you are willing and able. I invite you to rise also in body and spirit. Closing words by Don Cooley. Here may we know that you are lovable and that indeed you are loved. And may you carry that love out into the world as a blessing. John, would you please extinguish our chalice for us? I offer these words by Eric Williams. My friends, may the spirit of love be a living flame before you, a guiding star above you, a firm path below you, and a gentle presence behind you. May it be so, blessed be. Well, the choir has a very lovely, very sentimental little tune, little thought that we would like to share with you. Following that, we'll be singing closing, our closing song, Carry the Flame.
And as we continue to feel the love, I invite you to rise as you are willing and able as we sing a closing song, carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again.